Okay. We'll go ahead and get started and, and at least be recording. And I heard from a number of people that wanted to hear this that were afraid they were going to be late or not make it tonight. So um, so I work with Elizabeth Friedman. She's with the Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit in um, St. Louis area, uh, in Kansas City area. Um, and um, she works with Clean Air Now, which is a kind of an environmental justice group in uh, in Kansas City. And she is with, she's a chapter climate advocate for the pediatricians and she does a lot of research. And I'm sure any friend of hers is a friend of ours. So Jessica Thomas is a campaign manager for the Center for the Science and Democracy at the Union of Concerned Scientists. In her role, she helps implement campaigns for advocates, partners, and scientists to protect and promote the role of justice and science-based policies. She also works closely with the UCS Science Network, which offers scientists and technical experts training, resources, and in, um, engagement opportunities to bolster the role of science in public policy. Before joining UCS, Jessica was a program coordinator at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, helping students from underrepresented populations prepare for research careers and leadership positions in the biomedical sciences. She has a BS in biology and environmental science from the University of Massachusetts, Boston. And are you in Kansas City now? Jessica? I actually am in or Marion, in South Carolina. So I'm from Massachusetts, but okay. <laughs> live in Marion, South Carolina. Okay. Well, you guys can tell us how, how you know each other then. And, um, and um, we will let you take over. If you guys uh, that know how to want to stick your state or what you do on, on your uh, name tag, uh, just so they can sort of see, that'd be great. And we'll let you guys take it away. Excellent. Yeah, it would be awesome to see where you all are from. Um, it is very relevant to uh, this issue and kind of helps me, um, yeah, maybe even tailor some stuff, uh, tailor some of the content. So I'm going to try to share my screen. Let's see if it works because I'm not a presenter, but oh, I think it's working. Is it working? Uh, no, it's, yes, it's slow. It's well, it's slow on my screen. Maybe you guys oh, are seeing it. It's probably going to be slow. Yeah. There's you know, one thing about living in Marion, South Carolina, it's rural South Carolina. I do not have broadband internet access, if you can believe that. So things are a little slow with my satellite internet, but I'm going to do the best I can. So good to see you all. I'm going to do a little brief um, rundown of the issue here, then get into... Um, some of the the rulemaking process that's happening right now. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency is currently undergoing a rulemaking around several of the um, facilities that use ethylene oxide, but I'm gonna focus on commercial sterilizers. Um, and ethylene oxide, so it is colorless, it is flammable, it is a carcinogenic, um, it causes predominantly white blood cell cancers and also breast cancers. Um, it is used uh, in this particular case, I'm talking about, as I mentioned, sterilization, which is half of all medical devices in the U.S. are sterilized with ethylene oxide and some food products, particularly dried foods and spices. Some other uses of ethylene oxide include uh, making other chemicals, sterilizing plastics, um, but it is quite ubiquitous in its use. Um, and that's a sterilizing um, a, a equipment down in the, the middle bottom there. So, um, whoops, what's happening here? Okay, let's, um, let's start by diving into the climate connection. Um, Y'all are you know, particularly interested and motivated around climate. So um, this is ethylene oxide is produced from um, ethane, um, from ethane extraction. It is uh, produced from fossil fuels. Uh, it is a petrochemical. And they have to do this process. It's called cracking um, to produce the, to get the kind of products out of the ethane. And it is in extremely energy intensive and 
um, also tremendously polluting. So whenever we have a reliance on ethylene oxide or we use ethylene oxide, we are contributing to uh, climate change, to, to extraction, to processing, to the co-pollutants um, that are being emitted during the process, not to mention transportation issues um, and all of the other sort of life cycle of the petrochemical um, issues that we have. Um, so, and I'm going to put a blog in the chat for you all eventually that kind of makes a lot of those connections to climate clear as well. Super brief on ethylene oxide regulation. So for commercial sterilizers, um, it is, again, sterilizing medical equipment and food, some dried food products. Uh, the rulemaking, the health, the protection, right? Um, the regulation that protects folks from this, um, from, you know, ethylene oxide and the, uh, the products that happen with commercial sterilization or the pollutants that occur with commercial sterilization is nine years overdue. And in 2016, so seven years ago, uh, EPA's own scientists and, and others in the medical community and the research community really put a fine point on what I think a lot of folks already kind of knew was that it is, it's 60 times more toxic than had been previously sort of understood and had been previously regulated at. So for all these years, right, this stuff has been being utilized and emitted and Expo, you know, exposing folks to this, and it's way more toxic than how we had initially regulated it. In 2022, the EPA uh, published a risk assessment and a kind of a warning and a notification that 23 of these sterilizer facilities had such an increase, I call them heavy emitters. They had such a horrendous output of ethylene oxide that they were contributing to cancer risks well above what EPA considers quote unquote acceptable. And I put quote unquote for acceptable because we don't think any exposure to a carcinogen, to a mutagen is actually acceptable. Um, and Folks have been suing the EPA to take action, uh, and lots of public health experts, scientists, technical folks had been really voicing their outrage and their support for the utilization of this new value risk assessment. Um, and finally, I will say, yes, we have won this mini battle. Um, they have used this updated risk assessment in their rulemaking more recently, so that is good news. So we did an analysis, my colleague Daria Minovi did an analysis just this year, we published um, this map here shows, and I can give you a link to the story map, it's interactive and you can zoom in um, and put your address or different things to see where these facilities are. So when looking at two types of facilities, the commercial sterilizers, which I've talked about, and this other type of facility called miscellaneous organical, organic chemical facilities, um, which are very heavy emitters, 14 million people were within five miles of these facilities. And we wanted to map and give numbers for child care centers and schools because we know that uh, children are particularly susceptible to, um, you know, this pollutant to really anything that's like a mutagen carcinogen, right? And um, that we found, now the EPA here, this is an important piece. The EPA looks at, okay, commercial sterilizers. We're gonna regulate commercial sterilizers facility by facility. And we're not even gonna look at the facilities that emit ethylene oxide that are near these other facilities that are emitting, emitting ethylene oxide. So every time that they say, oh, this is the exposure of this community, they're talking about one type of facility. Not to mention all the other types of facilities that use and emit ethylene oxide. And not to mention even further, the, the facilities that are emitting ethylene oxide that are even within this, this single type of facility. So commercial sterilizers, um, about 90 something of them, some of them are clustered together. 
there we took a look at which ones were in within 10 miles of each other and kind of labeled those sterilizer hotspots. Um, so the potential risk to the community and to the workers in these areas is even increased even more so than what EPA was accounting for. And so that's a huge issue right there. I mean, the cumulative effect from all of the ethylene oxide exposure, never mind other pollutants, other social stressors, we call cumulative impacts or cumulative hazards. So something to kind of name there. Um, air toxic cancer risk in communities with facilities that emit ETO is like, is much higher typically. Um, and this is an environmental justice issue. This is an environmental injustice. People of color, people with low income, people with limited English language proficiency are by and large uh, tremendously impacted, disproportionately impacted. And Latina communities are actually um, most impacted and by EPA's own admission will continue to be most impacted even once this new rulemaking, once this new regulation gets put into place. And that's partially because Puerto Rico has eight facilities, four of which are the heavy emitters, the 22 facilities that um, EPA identified as just pumping out so much of so much ethylene oxide. So I want to name that in um, as we think about disproportionate impact. Okay, Elizabeth, I'm going to kick it over to you because I think I didn't cover all this. So go for it. I know you want to talk a little bit about the health risks and potential impacts. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> I just got my computer so that I could start posting some of the hyperlinks. Um, mm. Are are most of the folks um, in the audience clinically oriented? Is that a, a thing? Uh, I'm seeing a yes. Yeah. Okay. Mostly doctors and a nutritionist and a researcher, science medical researcher. Okay, so this graph, gra oh, I have a video now. Okay, this graphic is taken from the most recent IARC monograph on ethylene oxide. Um, and um, since, since some of you are researchers and clinicians, I will also put in the chat box once I get the slides open, um, um, some hyperlinks to some of the primary literature. Um, I, I was actually pretty surprised that um, it, it's it's pretty dated. The literature is really quite dated, but there's enough there for IARC to identify this as a mutagen and a carcinogen um, specific to, like Jessica said, um, uh, blood cell, blood cancers and um, now breast cancer. Um, and so I'll be sharing that um, information. Most of the research does come from um, occupational health related exposures. Um, uh, and I did find a couple of uh, articles that also go into community exposure, communities that are um, fence line to these industries. Um, and one pretty great report out of Some state that that, um, that identifies violations of the hopefully previous regulations, um, and they explain why they've identified these as, as violations and how they can be further enforced. Um, as clinicians, I think it's it's important that we that we recognize that you know. Infection control and sterilization of surgical equipment is really important, and it prevents disease and death. Um, and what most of today's literature really seems to be more focused on is the alternatives. Um, hydrogen peroxide is one of them. UV light is another one. Um, but I wasn't able to find one great article that really brought, uh, that really covered a, a full-on alternatives assessment. So I. I want to acknowledge that that's sort of a, a challenging space for us in that there are there are alternatives, but it's unclear which are most effective 
um, and to what extent. So I wanted to be forward and honest about that. Um, I think you already said everything oh. else, Jessica. There's no safe level of uh, carcinogen. So that's that's the environmental health concern. But I'll 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 leave it at that. Okay. Um so quickly, I don't know how much are folks familiar with the federal rulemaking process through the EPA and I mean actually all the agencies kind of and eh, kind of sorta no nah, not really. Okay. So let me stop sharing for a second. Um, so our regulatory agencies, right, which include the Food and Drug Administration, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Interior, et cetera, there's a lot of them. Um, they are tasked with, and Congress has tasked them with, um, you know, developing rules and regulations that protect our health, our safety, our food supply, you know, environment, et cetera. And so they are required to um, update these rules at a certain frequency or when new information comes to light or even when the public, you know, lobbies the agency and says, listen, we need to update these rules, these safeguards. Um, and they have to do so in a manner that is publicly accessible and allows for public engagement. So uh, currently we are in the public engagement process of the rule of the regulation that covers these commercial sterilizer facilities. And what happened was EPA with their scientists, their technical folks, their economists, their lawyers, all of that came together and said, okay, let's look at the information that we have and let's propose a rule. All right, propose this regulation. So they've done that. And now they're asking the public for their input. And this is particularly important to get input from folks like you all um, who have, you know, a medical training, who have a background in um, in health and um, to be able to share with the agency things that they're doing well and things that maybe they need to improve upon. It's also very important to hear from impacted community and workers in this process. So I'm going to share with you super briefly what is in this rule and what isn't in this rule, um, because it's important to kind of know, I think, how EPA is or isn't addressing um, this issue and how we can make sure that the EPA does address this issue. So quick, I got, I think I have like eight or nine buckets. Okay. Like I mentioned, they're using the best available science. They're using this, this updated cancer risk value. That is really important. We want to like congratulate them, thank them, encourage them to continue. I don't know about congratulate, but <laughs> encourage them uh, to continue using the best available science. Um, as I mentioned, it just underestimates the public health risk. I mean, within, again, this one type of facility that uses and emits ethylene oxide, they didn't even look at, oh, say in Minneapolis, there are five facilities within 10 miles of each other that are using and emitting ethylene oxide. They did not take the risk looking at all those facilities together, even if they're very close geographically to each other, never mind the other pollutants, the other stressors that folks are um, exposed to. So it really underestimates the health risks. Um, the rule doesn't include requiring fence line monitoring. And that's an issue because we don't want, you know, industry to just like have a, you know, be able to say, oh, yeah, no, I, I complied or, or yeah, everything's fine here because that's currently how it is and it's not working. And we know this because as soon as EPA did do the research and did start monitoring, they saw, oh, my gosh, a bunch of facilities are emitting so much ethylene oxide that it is outside even our accept, quote unquote acceptable risk. Um, so we want to encourage them to uh, require fence line monitoring and have enforceable actions. So you hit this uh, this uh, level of emission and you are fined and required to do something about it and stop it. Um, Offsite warehouses. So when, when things are sterilized with ethylene oxide, they continue to off gas. And oftentimes they 
put the materials in offsite warehouses that are actually usually very close to where the sterilization facility is, and they continue to off gas. I was just talking to a person from Covington, Georgia, <clears throat> that they have a sterilizer, uh, medical sterilization facility there, and they actually did fence line monitoring on their offsite warehouse, and it was something like 5,000 pounds of ETO were being was being admitted. And it was something that the agency is not accounting for and is not proposing that it will even account for it in this new rule. So this is just a whole other source of exposure that is not even included that needs to be included. Um, this is Basically, during startup and shutdown and malfunction, when a facility can emit a lot of ethylene oxide, there was a loophole in the regulations and in the laws previously. This change is to basically be in alignment with what the courts are mandating, which is that we get rid of the loophole. So that's a really good thing. We want to name that. Um, 18 months compliance for industry. We find we feel that that is not appropriate. Uh, it's already, as I mentioned, nine years delayed in creating this new rule, seven years since we knew it was much more toxic than it is regulated at. By the time the rule is finalized, the regulation is finalized and implemented, it'll be 10 years of people being exposed. And industry has known that this is coming for a long time. This has been um, you know, basically the, the, the sign has been there for a long time that this was going to happen, that the regulations were going to get stricter. Um, there are 11 research and development facilities that, uh, are not included that we are sort of asking EPA, okay, you say they're not included. Well, how are you actually monitoring those and regulating those? So that would be our, our recommendation. And then finally, getting to the phase out of ethylene oxide and alternatives, working with the Food and Drug Administration that has the auspice, that has the um, <clears throat> has the ability to really push for alternatives, safe alternatives, not ones that are just another chemical that we don't have enough information on that 10 years later ends up being, uh, you know, a carcinogen because that it happens over and over again. Um, and then how much time do we have actually? I'm trying to figure out, I don't wanna, I wanna give folks time to talk more too. Uh, maybe, uh, I, maybe another five or 10 minutes. Okay, total. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop sharing there and I'm gonna just um, put a link in the chat for people where a lot of resources live um, that UCS has pulled together, Union of Concerned Scientists, um, some links to EPA. We are encouraging people to write comments. We have a comment guide that includes all these bullets that I went through and more. Um, I have a comment writing worksheet that folks can, if you saw on that last side, slide, like qualities of a good, you know, comment it outlines those different qualities and helps you think through okay you know let me make sure i hit on this piece this piece this piece um and how to submit a comment and we just really want to drive comments to what they call the docket for this rule um i want to end with the the real impacts of this um in doing this work i've been able to meet and talk with lots of community folks from across the country. Um, I spoke to a woman in Memphis who was at her mom's um, hospital appointment getting cancer treatment. They live and she grew up directly across from a facility. Uh, yesterday I spoke to someone who, uh, or last week I spoke to someone who, whose wife was diagnosed with lung cancer and he gave oral testimony for the rule from her bedside as she was being, being treated. And he joined one of our comment writing workshops. And I asked him, how are you doing? And he said, not good. You know, my wife had just passed. And, mm -hmm. you know, he is now trying to sue um, the facility. He lives less than a mile from the facility. 
Um, and you know, people that have just been in tears at the, at the fact that they didn't know about this, that they didn't know it was near them, that who's impacted, you know, if you look at Puerto Rico, like it's just outrageous, um, as it is everywhere, really. Um, so I just want to end on that, like human note, like this is people's lives and people are, um, being impacted and they do say to me, like, thank you for like, submitting comments. Thank you for getting people out there to do this work. It's really important. So I just really encourage you all to do that. And I'll pause and we can talk about stuff and I can give you more resources. Happy to answer questions if I know answers. Thanks. That was amazing. Uh, Gabrielle. Yeah, I have a couple of questions. First of all, <clears throat> Can you send us your PowerPoint? That would be very helpful. I was trying to kind of copy it off. And um, I have done a couple of um, requests to speak at the EPA for, for the, in several dockets. And um, I know that the, there's the Mercury docket is coming up and a number of other ones. Is there a docket number on the, uh, or is it just a thrown in with nitrogen oxide and all the other stuff? So is it, do you know the doc, a docket number on this one? Yes, we do. Let me get that for you. Um, and actually and I can just pop in chat the comment writing worksheet so you can see it and the docket number is up at the top, including um, also how you get, you know, what the website on the federal register where you can submit comments and or um, an email address to submit comments. That would be great. And if can we get your PowerPoint because I couldn't copy it down fast enough. But when I'm doing the when we're, I'm from Arizona and we've done a lot of work on with mothers, moms, clean air force, and we've been involved in most of the um, ones that have come up. And um, so it would be so helpful to have very specific things to confront them with in a pleasant way, mind you, but and confront them with. And they are really listening to the, to what people are saying. Uh, that's the that is the feedback that we have had. But you you were you had so many good ideas. It would be great if we could use them in our letter in our writing. You know, writing up the um they whatever you know we speak. That would be great. Yeah, and, so can we get the recording Gabriel, or? Yeah, Gabriel and Lee, and uh, I need your emails. So if you will share that in the chat with me, um, we will get it to you afterwards when they send it to us. So we should send uh, to you, put your name in, Laurie? Put your, no, or, give or me your Jessica's. email. And Lee Goldstein, if she wants something, I don't think I have her email either. Um, and Cynthia wanted to ask something. Uh, we can't hear you. Oh, you're on mute, Cynthia. Yeah, hi. I said thank you. That was terrific. Um, I used to work in a dialysis facility uh, at times, and all of our dialyzers were sterilized with ethylene oxide. And we were thrilled because it was so much better than what it was replacing. I don't even remember what the chemical was before that. But so that idea of what do we replace it with and is it going to turn out to be worse in some ways is, is so important with, with all these chemicals. Um, so UV light would be interesting if it doesn't destroy the plastic. Um, but my other, so that's a comment or question. You talk about cumulative impact and how often that's not looked at and even with ETO, but are are these facilities located in those cancer alley and places where people are exposed not just to ethylene oxide but lots of other things and does EPA take that into account at all? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, many times, yes, they are located in EJ communities in you know places where there's heavy industry. Um, Cancer Alley does not have commercial sterilizers from what I can recall, but they do have other um, facilities that emit and use and emit ethylene oxide. So it is certainly, um, you know, in, in places where people are already exposed, like Memphis, um, Tennessee, this is in this facility that um, 
you know, the folks are fighting there is in South Memphis, which is predominantly black. Um, it is surrounded by lots of other facilities. And we see that over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And EPA is not really taking that into account. They really are not. I mean, they do an analysis looking at the demographics of folks most impacted, but how they're actually uh, taking action on that um, and how they're actually implementing like a cumulative impacts framework is a whole other thing that lots of folks have been pushing EPA on. And there's like hope that they're inching a little bit more towards it, but EPA and other agencies and other health departments, et cetera, need to continue hearing that from you all of the cumulative impacts, the cumulative hazards. Um, if it's not putting you on the spot, Karen, I just met Karen earlier tonight, and it sounds like you do medical journalism and you've been working on some stories related to medical packaging and ethylene oxide. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about what you do. And sure. Thank you. And sorry, I was late. I had another, I had a chapter meeting that went until six and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to make this meeting. Um, so yeah, I'm the editor of Healthcare Packaging Magazine. So obviously in that space, we cover ETO sterilization because it's, you know, been the most established um, technology or one of the most established. But um, last week there was an announcement at a medical device packaging show um, that I attend for um, basically n using nitric oxide, which is, um, I don't know how you guys feel about this. I'm very happy oh, to share wow. the article in the chat. Um, it's basically nitric oxide um, embedded within the packaging itself. And it needs to, I don't know, like, I feel like maybe you're familiar with it, but um, I'll put the link in the chat in case this is of interest to anybody. And I certainly don't want to um, self-promote especially when I showed up late, but um, yeah, it seemed like it had some um, some really good potential in terms of at least taking some of the place of, of the ETO volume that we have. Except that nitrous oxide mm, is terrible scary. too. So what do we know about that? Is it less? Oh, so it's nitric. It's nitric. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, here, I'll put it in the chat. Oh, yeah, okay. they were very clear to, it sounds <laughs> so similar. Uh, but yeah, this one is nitric. I'll put the link in the chat. Um, Dan has a question and he works a lot with physicians for social responsibility in Pennsylvania. Yeah, um, every couple of two, two questions. One is um, before this meeting, I actually uh, Googled ethylene oxide and Actually, I mean, ethylene oxide recycling is, you know, why can't these, these sterilizing companies just suck the gas back out of the chamber and reuse it? And uh, I, it brought, my search brought me to the EPA's ethylene oxide webpage, which mentioned a couple of very successful pilot programs in reducing the amount of ethylene oxide emissions. But then they have this page of additional questions about ethylene oxide, which I think really indicates um, EPA's ambiguous position on so many toxic chemical issues um, where they're trying to take industry's point of view into account uh, because it includes questions like, is ethylene oxide produced by the human body? And the answer is yes, when you breathe ethylene. Well, that's not a normal part of the air we'd like <laughs> to breathe. Um, and how far oh, do you have to be from an ethylene oxide facility to be safe? And they say, we can't say. Um, <clears throat> and why aren't you using fence line monitors uh, instead of creating computer models? And they don't have a clear answer for that either. Uh, it's just a lot of dissembling um, that, I don't know, it's influence of uh, people who were hired during the Trump administration or, or what. But uh, anyway, I think they really need a strong voice from our, our healthcare professionals to actually push them in the right direction and, and really get them to stick their necks out and risk some pushback from the industry. But that brings me to my second point, because industry, they the only thing they understand, and I hate to sound cynical, is 
dollars. And one thing CCL has been pushing is a fee on carbon. And it seems to me that since ethylene is a carbon-based product, then a fee on carbon is going to make it more expensive and hopefully get industry to move towards at least not dumping massive quantities of this into the air we breathe at the very least and at best find a safe alternative for sterilization uh, when you can't use steam. So uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, my initial take would be it's it's a great uh, like it's it's one prong of an approach and it's a great prong to to be able to to push and to, um, you know, try to get um, attack it from the like carbon emissions angle. I do think, you know, part of why we don't have a dedicated or specific position on, on alternatives is because we the way we need to operate in order to not continue to perpetuate historic and current inequities is to work with communities and the folks most impacted and make sure that we're offering solutions that they also agree with and that we have alignment there and we haven't been able to do that yet. So things like, you know, one of the alternatives is gamma radiation. And like, we've heard some initial like pushback around that. We want to make sure we have conversations around that, right? So I think the price on carbon thing too is something where I would just, you know, also check in with like EJ leaders, grassroots folks um, to see what their take is on that um, as, a, as an additional approach. Um, I got to come a little bit out of the weeds to understand this. So are these facilities, the ones that are creating like the pre-made lumbar puncture kits and, you know, the kind of things that you're using, or is it more for equipment, uh, like it sounded like from Cynthia? What what are they creating? What are they, what are they, what are they sterilizing at these facilities? I know a lot of what they are continuing because it's only 50% around half of medical devices are sterilized with um, ethylene oxide. My understanding is that a lot of what they are continuing to use it for are the things that are actually going internally into the body. Um, and so I think there were like stents and different things. And maybe Karen even knows uh, more about this given you've done a lot of reporting. Um, so I, I pass it over to you. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, I definitely agree that probably the majority of them are the implantables, but I know that that's not necessarily everything. I think it's a lot of patient contacting um, devices as well that aren't necessarily implanting, but um, like tools that, you know, that have some, you know, um, some sort of use in the surgery, uh, but aren't being left there. So, yeah. yeah and when you mentioned... You mentioned that hydrogen peroxide is an alternative. Is there a hydrogen peroxide gas? Because th this is a gaseous form of sterilization, right? Yeah, it's um, vaporized hydrogen peroxide is what they okay. would use. And so do you have any yeah, idea? It looks like Dan has. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> Another quick question. Um, I work in a, a health system with a whole network of outpatient practices, and we were recently forced to go from having our office surgery instruments uh, go to the steam steril sterilizer at our hospital to now getting disposable everything. So that includes mm -hmm. just that suture removal kits, which really are cheap and don't work very well, um, and so on. Are those disposable instrument kits also uh, gas sterilized? Because it seems to me that would be a great talking point to get my health system to change its mind. Mm. I would have to look. I would have to look into that. Um, but I do know ethylene oxide is used to sterilize plastics as well. Um, so my guess is yes. And Karen looks like maybe Karen knows as well. <laughs> yeah, plastics. Uh, also, yeah, wound care. Like I just remembered that I just wrote a story on um, 
bandages that are also sterilized this way. And obviously there's a ton of bandages out there in the world. So um, yeah, but yeah. Yeah. So do we know any, anything about the uh, alternatives like using uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide, et cetera, as far as the, the greenhouse effect and also, uh, you know, carcinogenicity of, you know, what we have available at this point. Yeah, that's a great question. There's some research, um, I think maybe Elizabeth, I don't know if you put in the chat, um, some of the the International Organization of Standards, is that right? ISO has done some work on, um, you know, around hydrogen peroxide and kind of recommending hydrogen peroxide as an alternative. And there would be some more details in that document. Okay. Um, there is one, I just do want to like flag, you know, that they, these like kind of, what a lot of community folks would call false alternatives um, or false solutions. And there's one chemical that they have also, that industry has started to move towards in some spaces. And the shorthand for it is PPO. I think it's polyphenol oxide. Um, and we have real concerns around that um, because it has already shown to have some health impacts and shown to be like a respiratory irritant. Um, not a lot of studies and information on it. So again, like we don't want to be in this cycle again, right? Of Like we don't have a lot of information about a chemical, so let's throw it out into the market. And then 10, 20 years later, we realize, you know, it's giving people cancer and then it takes us another 10 years to regulate it and not even as efficiently as, we, you know what I mean? So yeah, got to get out of that cycle. Got to get to the safe alternative. Cynthia. Yeah, um, I'm not a mute good. Uh, I'm curious if you have some sense of how much ethylene oxide sterilants contribute to as a greenhouse gas or, or, or the carbon production contributes to greenhouse gases. Is that, is that really significant? And and could this problem be solved by siting these sterilization plants far from human habitation? How like how far away do you have to be to dissipate this um, issue? Oh, <laughs> I, those I don't, are two I, whopper questions there. So what I read was that the ethylene oxide half-life is several hundred days and that um, but I was not able to find anything specific to plume size and how uh, how far uh, the plume extends. I did read that it doesn't break down with sunlight exposure and rain, that it stays in the atmosphere. Um, wow. But again, you know... I, I looked, but like those are the those were the key nuggets that I found, and I didn't see anything on plumes um, or or buffer zones that that would make this safer. And my suspicion is that that information just isn't there. Um, wow. But but maybe yeah. maybe maybe I just didn't find it. Maybe it's there. It's a good yeah, question, Daniel. I don't think there's any certainty around that. But that's really important. That like have like the persistence of this. Mm -hmm pollutant and um you know the only other thing i wanted to add in terms of like measuring how much it contributes to the use of it contributes to greenhouse gas emissions is a really hard question i don't have any numbers for you but i would just flag and i put a blog um post in the chat that talks about the connections to climate um it it's a feedstock so it's used to make other chemicals mm -hmm. um so it's like that whole life cycle thing, right? Of like fossil fuel extraction, transportation, like processing, you know, et cetera, all of that. It's it's contributing all along the way and contributing as it makes other chemicals. Mm -hmm. Daniel? No, sorry, I keep asking questions. I actually almost <laughs> forgot my question because Cynthia's question was so interesting. Um, <laughs> But anyway, this is more of a general comment question about cancer-causing chemicals because 
right there on the EPA's additional questions about ETO webpage, they say the question is, can I, how can I tell if my cancer was caused by ethylene oxide? Mm -hmm. And that's a question that comes up with every chemical environmental mm -hmm. pollutant that can cause cancer. Like, mm -hmm. you can't attribute that particular cancer case, but you can say, well, if you live right next to an ethylene oxide emitter, that's your biggest cancer risk right there, just as if your mm -hmm. house had high radon levels. Um, so what kind of language is most effective for EPA in our comments to address the cancer attribution question and that opportunity for people to dodge responsibility because they say, well, you can't prove it's our chemical. Yeah. That's good. I always had Elizabeth, you. The, I, <laughs> I always go back to the precautionary principle. I mean, and 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 I know that that's not how our government makes decisions, but it's just so logical <laughs> that I I don't I maybe maybe it's a, a there's a flaw in my argument because I just can't get past it. We know there's a risk. We know it's a carcinogen, and they have said there's no safe level of carcinogen. Although you know that's like the difference between NIOSH and OSHA, right? There's no safe level, but maybe a little bit. Um, <laughs> and and there are alternatives. And um, if if we have alternatives and we can um, invest in further research, which is which is another way that this group can be supportive when they um, have requests for requests for comment. I don't remember the last letter, feedback, information. Um, you know, we can advocate for, you know, studying alternatives and learning about the efficacy of alternatives and understanding them better as well. Yeah. That was direct. Well, I hope I answered your question. And so given that um, it sounds like uh, a lot of the uh, alternatives are sort of questionable, I mean, it sounds like this is a problem where it would at least be helpful to um, do, you know, what they've done with uh, coal-fired power plants. You know, you put better scrubbers, that kind of thing. I mean, obviously, the super emitters are must be people that aren't giving a hoot, just like the people that you know waste all the methane. Um, and so, is part of the rule that they have, uh, you know, that they have to contain it more? Do you know? Yeah, and it's a great like it. It um it seems so logical, right? Like we'll put in place some stronger um, containment systems because actually what mm -hmm. they're finding is a lot of the um, emissions are coming from fugitive emissions, so not out the main stack, but mm -hmm. actually out through just different crevices and things like that. Um, but in California, they put a containment system in place in one of the commercial sterilizer facilities and also put a fence line monitor there. And pretty soon after utilizing the containment system, the monitor peaked and showed huge emissions happening. And because California has stronger enforcement actions, they were actually able to shut that facility down as soon as they saw that peak. So our concern is you put these containment systems on, but they're not even proven to actually work. And here's an instance where it definitely didn't work and we have data and information around that. So, you know, mm -hmm. Okay, maybe do containment systems, but certainly like do a lot more around that. But like ultimately, we we gotta stop using this stuff. One more question. Um, getting back to dollars, one other way we can influence uh, industries to stop doing stuff that hurts people is to put a value on the injured people, injured parties' lives by suing the emitters. Um, yeah. Isn't it suing these companies for like the can high cancer incidents in, in the communities around them and making a case for the yes. high 
levels are correlated with high levels of cancer? Yes, they are. Um, the person that I mentioned whose wife passed away, he um, he's in Tennessee in Knoxville, I believe. And it's DeRoyal Industries, which is the facility near him. Um, he has hired a lawyer and is suing them for, uh, I don't know if it's called probable cause of death um, or contributing to death and disease. Um, the Southern Environmental Law Center is working with a number of community groups um, to, to, you know, file lawsuits to push um, local agencies, especially to um, take action, public health agencies um, and Earth Justice and along with lots of other litigants, including UCS, um, have been, um, you know, trying to <laughs> take EPA to court um, to, to move them along in this process and actually create a health protective um, rule. So, the, yeah, it's happening and it does need to happen. You're exactly right. And more could happen. Um, the thing I was thinking about when Elizabeth was sharing um, is t going back to the precautionary principle. I mean, me personally, so this is not like a UCS stance, but this is a me personal stance, is I think about who are we willing to sacrifice? So if we say it's acceptable for 101 million people to get cancer, is is one of those 100 my mom? Is it my friend? Is it your mom, your friend? Like, I, that is unconscionable to me. So, um, you know, I absolutely think precautionary principle is needed in, within the regulatory framework too. And it's not there, but it doesn't mean it can't be there. So how much work has been done um, it, that, that you guys know of, um, Elizabeth and Jessica and maybe even Karen, on um, the communities that are near these facilities? I mean, are, how much awareness is in a general community around these facilities that this is a cancer? I mean, sort of, I'm thinking of like, you know, with, with DuPont and Teflon, it took ages. And, and, and a lot of people actually loved the facility because it gave jobs to the community and everything. And it, you know, it took decades to sue them. And, and, you know, even at that, there was, you know, hardly any compensation. So are people at least aware or not? Does anyone know? Um, I am on the listserv and I'm part of the Earth Justice Coalition, and there are folks from across the country, community members from across the country that are part of that uh, coalition and that are aware, engaged, fighting on every level. You know, they're fighting the industry directly. They're petitioning their health departments to declare states of emergency. They're doing the legal aspects. They're go going to their policymakers. They're going to the media. I mean, people are just tirelessly um, doing this work. And not everybody knows, right? Not everybody who's in an impacted community knows, but there is, uh, especially the groups, the grassroots groups on the ground that have a bit of um, organizing capacity, um, or even just like one person who's super dedicated, they have been getting the word out. So another good thing about if we get your slides, I'd like to see that map and and uh, or if there's even a better breakdown on you know exactly which states it in, it's in because you know we now have um, a clinician for climate action groups in over half of the states like uh, you know Elizabeth is helping with in her state um, and so a lot of us are involved or leading these groups and um, just being aware of it in our state and and seeing what's being done. Uh, you know, some of the states are too small to even have EJ groups or not too small to, uh, I don't know, too ancient like mine <laughs> to have uh, uh, EJ groups in them. But yeah, just seeing what's happening and what, what we can do as healthcare providers to help that fight besides commenting to EPA. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. I can put, um, uh, in the chat, the story map, which is like, you can yeah. zoom in and out, you can put specific cities or states or um, locales. And for each facility that we've mapped, if you click on the facility, it'll tell you percent people of color, low income and non-English speaking or English as a first language, the number of schools and childcare facilities, um, 
the percent overall, if it's over five or 10% that ethylene oxide contributes to the overall uh, air toxics um, cancer risk in, in the community. So, you know, there, there's a lot um, there to, to see and, and you can figure out, you know, okay, let me see if there's a group nearby that's doing some work on it. And we do name a few groups that are working on the issue in that story map as well. Um, Elizabeth, are the are the pediatric environmental health specialty units? Um, is anybody doing anything on this? I'm thinking, especially region two, is it where Puerto Rico is included? Do you know? Yeah, actually, I don't know. I don't know if they if region two is, and I think Perry is Perry is one of the two Puerto Rico focused mm -hmm. individuals. So. She may know better. Um, uh, Susan Buchanan at UI University of Chicago in, in uh, Region Five. So she has done some presentations on it. Um, so she's kind of been the appointed, the point person for ETO, um, and then I know some other folks in her office, like Peter Oris, have also um, presented on it and. Um, I think are getting involved with the, you know, the workers' rights uh, angle. But there, there may even be a slide deck on the PESU website if it's up and running yes. again. It would, it would seem like, yeah, the workers would have a huge, huge risk of cancer. And it was, so, has any of the research looked at them or not? The uh, most of the research actually does come from um, uh, worker studies. Um, mm, okay. So the exposure pathways have been different, higher concentrations in shorter periods of time. Um, um, but yeah, that's at least the studies that I pulled up. And if you look at the IARC, that'll they'll reference other studies too. But um, most of okay. the research comes from them. Yeah. Okay. Well, we try to stop on time, so I think we should stop. This is absolutely fascinating, and I will put together these notes and resources to send out, and also your all slides. And I think we can do a lot more distribution because a lot of us are sort of in this, you know, pretty pretty hardcore, pretty full time. Um, and and uh, just so next month, Lisa Del Buono is going to be talking about the En-ROADS model and how to use it from the health aspect. She's given a lot of um, a lot of presentations on this and not to take everybody's time, but Gabrielle, I don't see your email in the chat. Do you want to just tell me out loud what it is? If you want the slides. I, I did send it. Uh, maybe I sent it to Lori did by you? a mistake. Or, anyway, it's L A. I don't, I don't know. I did. Uh -huh. I thought, sorry, okay. I, okay. L A W. Uh -huh. G A B is in ball. Triple seven 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 at gmail.com. Thank okay, you. Great. Okay. L I W G A B seven seven seven. And thanks for doing that. That's going to be very, very helpful because I work with a climate group here that's very involved right now with the EPA. And I will pass this on to the whole group with a lot of the um the links that um were in the chat. Thanks. Yeah, this Thank was this was guys. fantastic. Yes, uh, thank yeah. you so much. Hey, everyone, excellent. Thank you. And thanks for organizing. Your, sorry. Well, can, can you put me on your mailing list? Because I'd like to get in on your chat. I will. Yeah, I, I will email you. En road. Okay. Yeah, I will email you on okay, it. Thanks. Uh, yeah, how to do it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Jess and Liz, it was awesome. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.